Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this week's Q&A is um, with Dr. Judith Ford from Healthcare Partners Nevada. Um, our topic today is patient care in a time of crisis, which is something I'm sure we're all very interested in. Just wanted to tell you a little bit about Dr. Ford and thank her for joining us. Um, she obtained her undergraduate at Boston College and attended University of Connecticut for med medical school. She's an East Coast girl. We're gonna get over that. We're fine with that. East Coast is good. It's a good blend. <laughs> um, she completed her residency in internal medicine at Harvard affiliate Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston, which I feel is an entire topic we can discuss at a later date as well. Um, Dr. Ford joined Healthcare Partners in 2011 and assumed the role of Associate Medical Director for Nevada CHAPS and Quality Departments in 2016. I did learn what CHAPS is, I'm not gonna tell you now. Um, when, she, when she passed her certified professional coder exam in 2017, she was promoted to medical director for clinical quality in Nevada. And I love the idea that clinical quality is in your top in title, especially considering what we're discussing today. But thank you, Dr. Ford, for joining in us. We do really appreciate you having your, you here with us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I am I'm coming to you from my home, so um, you'll hopefully no one will walk in. But I am uh, I am uh, physical distancing today. Yes, that's totally what we're doing. We're we're following rule number one, which I feel good about. Um, but interesting enough, uh, in terms of our topic today, it applies a lot to um, still people having medical issues that may not be coronavirus related. And as a matter of fact, I will tell you that I got what we are calling the flu about four weeks ago. Hmm. And I was laid out, couldn't move, couldn't get off the couch. Um, I'm calling it the flu because I did go see my doctor and she didn't touch me. <laughs> she looked at me and said, yeah, you got the flu, go home. And that's what I, I did. But I realized, especially considering present a lot of people that have uh, they're fighting breast cancer, that are going through breast cancer treatments. Life still goes on. So I wanted to talk to you a little about how to balance that. Other sicknesses, other diseases, along with this coronavirus that we're in these, you know, no touching, don't breathe on anybody. So we had a few questions. They came from different places. Some of them came from out of state but I'm always willing to ask them. So I just wanted to start with the most obvious one, which is um, healthcare partners is a provider. Correct. You guys are a doctor's facility. Are you still open? Are you, are you, is it open and business as usual? Yeah, so I wouldn't say business as usual, but um, we are open. So healthcare partners is a multi-specialty medical group. Um, so our core business is primary care. Um, so Medicare patients, um, younger uh, patients with other insurance, Medicaid, pediatrics, women's health. We also have our own oncology division and cardiology division and uh, endocrinology division. So our main uh, uh, business is outpatient medical care. We do have hospital doctors who round um, in our hospitals on our patients, but that obviously supports our um, outpatient clinics. So yeah, so um, all of our outpatient clinics are open, um, but in terms of business as usual, I would say no. So when possible, we are converting regular visits to video visits. Um, and so um, that technology, you know, we were kind of on the edge of rolling that out anyway. And obviously this um, COVID crisis kind of pushed us um, over the edge on that. And mm -hmm. honestly, when this is all over, we'll have to look at, you know, how many visits really do need to be done in person, mm -hmm. right? I think this, you know, this has really taught us that not everything has to be done face to face. Mm -hmm. So um, we are still, uh, so we do as many visits by video as possible. And that would include sick visits. We really don't want sick people who might have COVID into our clinics. So um, we are trying to do as many sick visits via video, but we are still doing face to face visits. Um, obviously a smaller percentage than we used to. Um, some routine visits we are pushing out. Um, if 
if that's, you know, what is correct to do medically. Um, but like you said, life goes on and we have women who are pregnant who are yeah. seeing their OBs. Yeah. Um, and we have kids who are getting vaccinated, routine vaccinations. Um, so uh, yes, all of our clinics are open and um, seeing patients in some way. We do also run for urgent cares and obviously our urgent care facilities are booming. Yeah. Um, and we could probably fill an hour talking about how our urgent cares are handling COVID patients and non-COVID patients and how we separate those two. Right. Um, well, so just along those lines then, so you do, well, you're right, people are giving birth and kids are having vaccines and people are breaking legs and arms, unfortunately. Right. So how do you prepare the clinic? What do you, is there a process you guys have to go through to prepare the clinic for people to visit? And I, I was just hearing today also, some clinics are telling you to stay if, if you're waiting to stay in your car and they'll call you when it's open how are you guys going about that right so in general we're encouraging patients in a routine clinic not an urgent care a routine right. pcp clinic we're encouraging people to not walk in sick um and so we have signs on all the doors that say if you're sick go back to your call, call us, and we'll arrange a video visit for you or a phone call visit for you. Um, so um, if that doesn't work, we also have people greeting at the door. Um, so if we identify a patient who's sick, we can get them masked um, as quickly as possible um, so they don't infect our waiting room or the providers or the, the check-in folks. Um, so that's generally what we do. We have signage to try to send them back to their cars. And if that fails, we have human beings putting masks on them immediately. Okay, good. And then, um, you know, it's funny because I know the mask, yes to mask, no to mask, yes to mask. I'm into the mask. I think it's a great idea. But I'm wondering, how do medical providers feel, doctors, nurses, about their odds of getting coronavirus? Do, I look at it and think it's got to be astronomical. But what do I know? I'm not a doctor. So. Yeah, so um, it's a good question. So so there's, there's a lot of different conversations we could have around masks, you know, for the general public. For healthcare providers, it's a little more simple. So there are two reasons for masks in an office. Either the sick person is wearing a mask, so they're not infecting people, or we have what we call PPE, protective personal equipment, to protect the caregiver. Um, and so that's pretty clear for us what we should do. We surgically mask the sick patients who are coughing and sneezing. And then when the provider walks in the room, they're wearing the appropriate level of PPE for that patient. Oh. Um, in a clinic setting, that would mean a face shield, a surgical mask, and at least gloves, maybe a glove and gowns. We're not um, talking about testing for COVID in our clinics or in a hospital setting where you need to go even one step further with those fancy N95 respirators. Mm -hmm. um, so we are, we are using what we call droplet precautions in our outpatient clinics, protecting our uh, caregivers appropriately right down the middle CDC guidelines. Okay, excellent. And actually, you know what, here, uh, one of the things that I've realized is that if we stick to the CDC guidelines as a population, we're also doing our part. So I yes. something I'm constantly reminding myself of, our constituents, everybody is CDC guidelines are there for a reason. And actually, it kind of goes along with one of the questions we had about that fine line, right, between patients' rights and the caregivers saying, no, this is how it's going to happen, and this is why we're doing it this way. How do you communicate that to somebody who's upset, like stressed out, scared to death? Overnight? Yeah, and the example um, I give is if somebody is sick and refuses to wear a mask in our clinic. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, um, the real life situation that we faced a couple times. Oh, wow. Um, and so we say, look, you know, we want to take care of you, um, but we need to protect the rest of the patients here and our caregivers. And if you're not going to wear a mask, please go back to your car and we'll take care of you by video or telephone. So, um, you're right that there has to be a balance between protecting our healthcare workers and the patients that are in that clinic and what the patient wants. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had that situation a couple of times in our outpatient clinics when patients don't want to wear a mask mm -hmm. for whatever reason, it's hot, it's uncomfortable, they're upset. 
Um, generally speaking, and you know, healthcare, I love working at healthcare partners. I mean, everyone is kind of on super um, uh, notice of trying to be kind and trying to be compassionate. And you know, uh, somebody mentioned to me, it's, it feels like everybody's in that space, that yeah. everybody's trying to give people a little bit more of uh, a little bit more compassion and love. And so we're trying to do that too. But you're right, everyone is stressed out. People don't understand what their real risk is. Mm -hmm. And that applies to one of the things I was thinking, because there are other people with other sicknesses, and I imagine that people are used to getting what they want to get in the time they want to get it. So like, let's say they have um, COPD or, you know, something other than the coronavirus, and their prescriptions are due, right? And they're, yeah. they're out of how do you deal with that? Like, are, can, are you writing prescriptions yeah. even though they're not able to come in? Yeah. Or like I said, we're doing telephone and video visits when we need to. Okay. Um, and actually the state of Nevada loosened up a little bit on narcotics. So um, as you know, we, during all of this, we had that uh, huge opioid crisis. And so there yeah. were very strict rules about face-to-face -face visits. And right. even the state has opened up and a video or telephone visit would count um, for a narcotic refill. Um, also, the state pharmacy board is allowing longer prescriptions um, on narcotics. So going from a 30-day to a 90-day. Um, so yes, we're, we, we're, we're refilling prescriptions as normal. That has not changed at all. If a visit is required, we're often doing that by video or um, telephone. If it's required, sometimes right. it's not required. It can be pushed off 30 or 60 days. Okay. So, and then so, again, I just, I just thought of this, but it is in this vein is um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the impression from you and I'm wondering if you feel the same. If someone has a medical issue that is outside of, of um, coronavirus, I'm sorry, my cat is attacking me. I, ah. I, it's, it's part of being home. It, this is what happens. She's literally stabbing me in the back. It's okay. Um, sorry about that. Do you, you feel that their issues are being dealt with? It's not like people have to worry that they're not being heard, right? They are being heard. We know that other things are going on. One way or another, we're going to be able to help them. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and absolutely. That's what people needed to hear because I, I, I think a lot of it is, oh my God, I, I have to stay home. I can't go to the hospital if I don't have the, but if something may, if you're having a heart attack, pick up the phone, dial 911. Correct. So in that sense, don't change anything. If you feel you are at risk and something is happening, take the steps you need to take in order to make sure you're, you're going to be okay. Correct? That's right. And the other thing that this is kind of demonstrating is, you know, people don't have P primary care doctors, you know, um, and so that, you know, that's kind of been a light has shown on that, um, that if they do get sick, where do the, you know, a lot of, especially young people kind of float without a primary care. And they say, if I get mm -hmm. sick, my hairdresser, right? She said, if I get sick, I just go to urgent care. And so is that the best strategy in, for healthcare? So again, um, after this is over and we're back to, uh, back to normal, you know, will people realize that, hey, I really need to have a relationship with a PCP who knows me so I can pick up the phone and call if I have a question or if I need something. Um, so, you know, what we, and we believe in that, right? Our whole model is medical home and, and getting our arms around people. So, um, you know, it just kind of proves what we do. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I talk to people all the time. I say, well, who's your PCP? Well, I don't really have one. It's like, well, you really should have one. <laughs> you know what? That's a, actually a great lesson. I, I love the idea of having uh, takeaways when these are done. And I do have a, a PCP, primary care physician, right? Am I getting that correct? Or a provider, because we have a lot of great nurse practitioners and PAs. Yep. Oh, that's, see, this is why I need you, because this way I can actually get it right. Yeah. Um, so that might be something we will add to our arsenal, too, when we're talking to people. So thank heavens we learned. 
Right. Just, and so like even someone who survived breast cancer or ha who has a specialist for their um, illness, a lot of times the specialists don't want to deal with right. kind of more pedestrian stuff, traveling and vaccines and general questions. So even if somebody has survived or has a chronic illness that they have a specialist, a lot of times those specialists, first of all, don't have the expertise and second of all, don't have the interest or time right. um, to, to take care of those issues. So, you know, those people should all have a PCP they're plugging in with at least a couple times a year. Yeah, great, great, great information. So I'm going to ask you this last question. Sure. And uh, we all know how to go about avoiding coronavirus. Not that everybody is doing it, but hopefully they'll start. But I get, you know, our social distancing, washing our hands, stay away from sick people, all those things that we're supposed to be doing. Right. But what I haven't learned and I am curious about is what is the life cycle of the virus when it is in someone? Like as it's manifesting, for lack yeah. of a better term, what, what's happening? Like, do you, can you explain to us maybe from like, not exactly, because I know it'll be different for different people, but in general, you, you, you have symptoms and then what? Yeah. So um, after an exposure to somebody who's sick, um, and that's your right, your risk of being infected. So we believe that spending 10 minutes within six feet of someone, um, that looks like a close contact, right? Um, okay. So that's where that six feet comes in, right? Um, and that's your exposure. 99% um, of people will get symptoms if they've been infected within 14 days. And so that's why the CDC set the quarantine as 14 days. So um, if you've been exposed to somebody who turns out to, you know, was coughing and sneezing and turns out to be COVID positive, if you have had no symptoms within 14 days, you're, um, you're good. You're in the clear. Um, the average incubation is five days. Okay. Um, so that's the average of when a person is exposed to when they have a positive test. Most people have illness of coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, that's 80% is considered mild. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't need to go to a hospital, a mild disease. They would just stay at home like you did with the flu and just kind of ride it out and get better. Mm -hmm. And most people have illness that lasts between two and nine days. Okay. Very wow. similar to the flu. <laughs> um, so that's kind of typical. Now, obviously, you're most infectious when you're sick. Yeah. Um, the studies show that, you know, when they talk about viral shedding. Um, and so you're shedding the most virus when you're sick. So that's usually when the exposure is the worst. Okay. Um, and there's been all sorts of studies where people shed a little bit at 48 hours before and probably their shedding drops off at about seven to 10 days. Um, so, you know, not 100%, but that's kind of the parameters. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and like I said, 80% are mild. And so that's, you know, a, a, there's a lot of ang uh, uh, anxiety and fear about it. Um, because we see the people who are in the 5% or who are critically ill. But mm -hmm. the reality is most of us, if we were to get it, would have a mild disease, would stay at home. They'd, be, they'd have a miserable week and yeah. then they'd recover completely. Oh, see, and I, it, we know that you're right. I find that the media helps me get a little upset every once in a while, which is why I take a step back. And I'm so thankful that I have these opportunities to talk to people that know way more than I do, <laughs> which makes it um, good. And that's why I wanted to share with our constituents as well. And that was just one of the questions I noticed. We do talk a lot about getting it, like getting it. But I, I just was like, what is the cycle? So it's yeah. really, really great information to know. And obviously, and we haven't talked about what the classic symptoms are, but um, fever, um, yeah. about 90% of people with it have fever. Fever is usually defined as 100.5. Um, and this is also a, a moment, like a lot of people don't have thermometers at home. This is a nice teaching moment that people should have thermometers. Cough and shortness of breath. Those right. are the three big ones. Um, there are some people that get a diarrhea. There are some people that get headaches. There are some people who get muscle pain, fatigue, stuff like you experience with the flu, mm -hmm. but those are considered more minor symptoms. So the three mm -hmm. big ones that we're looking for um, to say, yeah, I think this is probably coronavirus, fever, cough, and shortness of breath. 
Right. And obviously, if the shortness of breath gets severe, those are the folks that need to go to the hospital. Again, that would only be about 20%. And then the critically ill ones are the ones that need to have breathing tubes to um, support them while they recover. Right. Okay. See, that's, and that's actually, that is calming information. Um, and having had the flu, I will tell you, I did not have shortness of breath, which is why I keep telling people I did not have coronavirus. I just had the flu. I had a terrible cough. I got a cold and all that. But um, I still self quarantine myself, right? Oh, I still absolutely. Go to work. So, yeah, the flu is contagious. Yep, in the yeah. same way that Corona is. It's droplet precautions, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I was on the uh, Southern Nevada website the other day. We have had about um, 1,300 cases of flu um, this season. Our flu season was considered moderate. Um, the cases are dropping off a little bit, as you would expect in the beginning of April. Right. Um, but we've obviously had. Um, a kind of normal flu season in, in um, Southern Nevada. So, you know, flu is out there, strep is out there, all the spring um, GI bugs are out there like rotavirus and norovirus and all that stuff. Um, so all the normal stuff is still out there, which is makes it complicated for providers to know what they're dealing with. Right. But just be aware, because I was aware enough to know I didn't have one major symptom, which was the shortness of breath. Right. I didn't have... The only reason I had a hard time breathing was I had a cold. So, you know, I'm like, I know the difference. So just take a moment, evaluate what's going on in your body, right? Yeah. And the coronavirus is a lower respiratory infection. So that's where that shortness of breath comes from. So if mm -hmm. all your symptoms are kind of in your head and nothing lower, um, it probably is not coronavirus. That does not replace talking to your PCP, seeing Absolutely. if you should get tested. We are testing um, at one of our uh, urgent cares. Our WIN urgent care is testing for coronavirus, but only with um, a PCP referral, only okay. with a provider referral. Um, UNLV is testing the general public. Um, again, there would be a, a phone number that folks would need to call to talk to a nurse to go through that screening process. So you can't just walk in and say, hey, I want testing. You do have to meet clinical criteria. Right. Uh, hey, you know what? You just reminded me. I do want to ask you one more question. I'm sorry. It's going a little longer than I expected. But um, for those who have had the coronavirus, yeah. are they going to get it again? Yeah, it's a good question. So we believe and remember that, you know, it's the novel coronavirus. This, this is a new coronavirus that came onto this planet in December. We believe that if you have had this COVID-19, you are immune, at least for this season. Okay. Um, now, it could be that this virus mutates like seasonal influenza does, yeah. and next year would be a slightly different strain. Um, so we don't know that yet because we're still kind of in it, but if we feel fairly confident that if you've had it, mild case recovered, that you're kind of protected at least for this season. And then hopefully by next season, they'll be starting to talk about vaccines and such. Okay. Awesome. Wow. I'm like, I'm like, my heart is going a million miles an hour in a good way. This has actually been a really, really great conversation. And I cannot tell you how much we appreciate your time, Dr. Ford. Thank you and, so much. And I also thank healthcare partners for making you do this. <laughs> I'm going to thank my healthcare partner and partner. And um, I do appreciate your time. So great. thank you so much. Thanks so much. Bye.